And now I think it's time for questions, responses, observations, rebuke. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, Shab was a product of this uh, era. Yeah. So for people of some type of uh, learn learnedness, how do we extend that forgiveness when they should know better? When, you know, just saying that they're a product of uh, an era, does that give them that leeway yeah. to be wrong or be, you know, destructive in their uh, work product? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. That's probably the ultimate question here. Um, Given the fact that belief in the superiority of North European Protestant culture was pretty much universal amongst North European descended white folks uh, in the United States and in Europe, um, should Shop be held accountable for uh, not being able to transcend that? Or should we say he's just a product of his time and, you know, that's excusable? Or should we say he was a smart guy and he should have known better? That's, that's the ultimate question. And you can even throw in, he should have known better because he was actually familiar with the African-American church, but he left it out of his histories. Other questions or observations? Yeah. I don't want to preempt anyone else speaking because I'm more interested in hearing what you have to say than what I have to say. But I keep thinking about two kind of amusing things that happened at the seminary with some of our international students. Uh, this doesn't directly contribute, but maybe it'll turn up a thought. Uh, one day, someone came into my office, one of our German students, and he said, I've discovered this scandalous writing by Philip Schaff. It, it expresses his disdain for the people of central Pennsylvania. You know, he thought that these rural people were really uncultured and rough and uh, very, um, Un undesirable. And so when Schaff first, it was an early writing of Schaff. So he was like, now let's keep this a secret, you know, because he really did express great disdain for the people of the seminary. You know? So it was just so funny that he uh, had to reveal this secret. Um, and can't we just bury this somewhere? <laughs> um, Another thing that I thought was kind of amusing is we had a Japanese uh, student uh, who studied with us for a semester. He's actually a pastor in Japan, and he also um, now teaches on the faculty of Tokyo Union Seminary. And he presented a paper at the Mercersburg Society, and we had someone come as a Philip Schaff impersonator. So this was just kind of a jokey thing. You know, he dressed up like Philip Schaff. And uh, the Japanese young man who really, really does hold Schaff in high regard as a theologian for the reasons that Professor Barrett said that, uh, that Schaff embodied this um, uh, very sophisticated theology and uh, even a multiculturalism, but, um, uh, Reverend Yudai Fujino was just so honored that he met this person who represented Philip Schaff to him and had his photograph taken with Philip Schaff. So it just shows how this person of Schaff um, is very um, ambiguous and, um, and it strikes people in different ways at different times. One way of thinking about Schaub's career is that it, it, his vision of uh, 
cultural enrichment, and you might even say multiculturalism kept expanding. It started out very narrow. German culture, German Protestant culture, is the crowning achievement of Western civilization. And he got here, and as uh, Professor Lich mentioned, he held even the Pennsylvania Germans in contempt. They're, they're barbarians, they're savage, they eat with the wrong fork, uh, they don't know who Goethe is, um, and they're starting to speak English, and their sausage is terrible. <laughs> um, so he, so he, he began to, uh, he, he, to insist on the Germanization of the Pennsylvania Germans. He, then, then he began to say, well, there are some interesting things about English culture that I'm seeing in, in Pennsylvania. Maybe we have some things to learn from that. So he expanded it and he started to speak English. And then he expanded even further. And maybe even the Irish and the Italians and the Poles, they all might have something to contribute to the mix. And then by the end of his life, he was expanding it beyond Europe to, well, yeah, I used to think that the Chinese were all, all were in an opium-induced stupor. But I see that they're really smart and they're industrious, and maybe we have something to learn from them. And I used to think that Native Americans were a lost cause, but they, they've got something to contribute to the mix. And um, and, and and he extended that to other religions. So at the Parliament of World Religions that he initiated, to tell the truth, about ninety percent of the participants were Christians of one sort or another. But they included Orthodox. And they included uh, folk from in, Christians from India and Ethiopia and Egypt. Um, and they included some Buddhists and Hindus, and he wanted more. So his vision kept expanding, and then he died. You know, so, so the multicultural part of it, I can understand, and I don't know if he ever really came to accept them the Hindus and the Muslims as equals. But in this country, um, somebody being so prominent in, in religion, how do you think Shuff's teaching affected freed African Americans? Did it enhance their freedom and their equality? Or did it give uh, an opportunity for people to continue to think that um, African Americans were not equal? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, all I can say is that Frederick Douglass was aware of Shaw and, and liked his work. Uh, but that's about as, that's the only documentation I've been able to find. Um, Frederick Douglass is not an educated man. Right, right. Oh, self-educated, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Good afternoon. Hi. I don't know that I have a question so much as I have a comment. Um, and first, um, I applaud the, the institution and um, just the work that's gone on, um, the intentional work that's gone on around this subject. Um, I, I think, um, of course, I've personally been, you know, just thinking about all of it, and I'm grateful for all of this research and information that you saved me a ton of time in doing. So uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I think one of the things that, that I keep coming back to um, when we think about um, Schaff being um, just a man of the time and um, sort of, you know, this is just kind of the thought of the time and even, you know, things that he wrote and said publicly um, that, that were um, the thinkings that he had. And even kind of, um, I was really grateful for church history and for some living Christian movements for, for some of the things that you were saying. And I'm getting the feeling that there was this sort of process theology thing that's happening for him, that he's, it's the involvement, um, that things aren't, you know, rapid, but there's this just gradual um, evolution of the ways in which we become more like God or the ways in which we become um, ideal or the ways in which Christianity becomes ideal, right? So, um, in thinking that, that that's the place where he's coming from, I, I'm looking in his life and looking in the information that you gave for this gradual evolving and, and it's there. Um, I think the, the challenge that I have is, okay, but then it stopped, right? Because we can't live forever. Um, and I think that that's the, that's the piece that we have to wrestle with is, 
um, given that that there's no more beyond that, right? So if he could have lived, you know, 500 more years, where would he be? Um, so I, I think I'm kind of stuck with that, that, you know, things were cut short and is, and, and is the, the process that he made in his life, the mental process and the intellectual workings that he'd done and the evolution of those, are we satisfied with them stopping where they did? And, and to that end, um, like Ms. Patricia has said, the workings and then the works, the, the, the written pieces and um, the lectures and things that he did, how well did they inform um, a very oppressive um, ideology for, or, or permission for white supremacy in so many institutions that we know? And I think that that's you know, another piece that we have to wrestle with, that, while things did evolve for him and while he did evolve, um, but not quite far enough, how he informed other institutions and how he informed um, the church, right? And how he informed, um, because the church has a problem with race still even in 2019. And, and how much uh, did what he say and do inform that and continue to do that? So um, I just think about those things. And finally, I'll say this, I think one of the things that we know as preachers and as teachers is that this is part of the risk, right? Whenever we stand up or whenever we are an authority on something, that, that that will outlive us, right? That our legacies will go on and that um, what we say in 2019, when it's researched 50 years from now, it's still going to be what I said in 2019. And that's, that's something to contend with as well. And I don't know that, that I give someone a pass just because that was the time. I think he took on that role to be an authority. He took on that role to be, um, to be you know, someone that we could rely on for these matters. And just given the, the times really, unfortunately for me, just doesn't offer a pardon. So. Yeah, that, this has been raised earlier. I think you're raising the question of could he and should he have known better, uh, especially since he was in a position of authority. They realized that on, on some things he had made a mistake. Um, he had thought that slavery was going to die out naturally because people would become kinder and gentler. And then uh, at the beginning of the Civil War, he said, oh no, the slaveholders in the South, they're serious. They're not going to give up without a war. And so he changed his mind on that one and realized that he had been, um, he'd just been wrong. Um, so that does raise the question of the responsibility of public figures to maybe transcend their era. Yeah. Just to follow up on what uh, he just said, so people that should know better, do they need always something disruptive, uh, you know, such as a civil war or finding out that you have a gay child for you to flip? And does that damage the, the effect of the change? Is there an accusation that can be thrown at you of being a hypocrite if just an event is change, you know, making you change your mind? Yeah. It's good because it really was the shock of the Civil War that jolted him out of his gradual emancipation view to, no, it's got to be immediate. Uh, and if the Civil War had not happened, if he had not seen some of the African Americans who's, whom he knew and some were even regarded as friends, um, if he had not seen them being kidnapped by the Confederate troops, would he have changed his mind? And so maybe it takes a big jolt, like a war. Yeah, adding to what you just said, I was disturbed that his commentary around African American seems to end. And I'm wondering also then, was his experience of war perhaps shut him down to the point that he, he struggled with talking about this? about what has this done to African, um, people of African descent. There's a piece of his work, and I've struggled with it as a lesbian Christian, for what it's cost me in my life, 
is that there's this hierarchical thinking that keeps contributing to the enslavement of the human mind uh, that causes us to always be making these choices, well, this or this or this, and that that, that also is part of this legacy. And I would hope if we are, as an institution, looking to get rid of racism, that we would examine our ways of making knowledge, uh, sharing for and with one another, how we are learning, what we are learning, you know, and what resources that we so just Just thoughts. And he did think in, in binary terms, or hierarchical terms, as did well, well, yeah, well, <laughs> probably all of them. And he did not, uh, one of the unfortunate uh, aspects that we did not talk about is he did not support women's suffrage. Yeah, uh, I'm hearing the conversations about he, he was involving. And I guess my question to you, um, was he involving? Because uh, I heard, okay, he died and then it, and it stopped there. But I'm wondering what stopped. Um, and if he was involved, <clears throat> okay, it's one thing to, to have an epiphany, it's one thing to come to realization, but did he ever apologize? Did he ever show any remorse? Um, for the countless lives um, and the brutal behaviors that were enacted on people of color because of his stance. That, that would be helpful to me. Um, not just he died, but was he in that process? And before he died, did he ever try to recant what he said and said, I'm sorry for what I've done in the lives that it that it hurt. Yeah. Um, he did admit that he had been wrong about immediate event uh, about his opposition to immediate emancipation. He did admit that. Um, that's about it. Um, he didn't really apologize, but what happened was simply that his um, sphere of concern expanded um, so that he start out by, I think Germans are cool. That was, oh no, it's Germans and people from the British Isles. Then finally, no, it's anybody from Europe. Then finally it moves to sort of towards it's anybody from anywhere uh, that has something to contribute to uh, global civilization and global Christianity. But he never, um, he never apologized for being initially more, uh, shall we say, culturally narrow-minded. That I know of. Sorry. It would be interesting, there is one illustration that you gave of his extending um, care for someone, I think that was a slave book, Stay in my fields, come in my house at night. Oh, yeah. There was some protective mechanism. Well, it was a free one. Love to see it, it was, it was work. Work. she evidently had, had been an escape slave, but she was uh, she was his his cook. That's back when faculty made enough money to have cooks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he and he, he knew other people uh, who had worked at the seminary who had been kidnapped. You know, African Americans who had been kidnapped and taken south. You know, that that for him was you mentioned trauma. That that for him was traumatic. Um, he wrote about it very little, but when he did, it was with great anguish. I, I just want to um, reiterate something that it was a constant theme in the lecture, and that's the separation between race, um, slavery, and culture. Yeah. I think for us, it's really easy to, to conflate particularly race and slavery. Um, and if you've been in a class with me, you'll know that I'm a really stalwart 
person when it comes to the separation of these two things because abolition and anti-racism are not the same things, right? right? Exactly. So because you were kind to a slave or because you helped a slave escape did not mean that you felt like you were equal with the slave, right? right. So um, there's a lot that, that, that was said in the lecture today about um, the moral, I don't know, that the, the, the blacks were morally inferior or, or whatever that language was. So that's like evidence for me, right? That while, you know, you can be on the side of abolition, but you are not on the side of anti-racism. Yeah. And while that may be, you know, of the time, I think it's important for us to remember that these two things are, are not really related much at all. Right, and, and um, I, I think he realized that because he, he said early on that the end of slavery is not going to end the race problem. Mm -hmm. um, and he was consistent on that. Um, yeah, and the, the tragic thing about him, the unfortunate thing is for a while he, in the 1850s, he was saying things that sounded like racial inferiority. That different races have different innate characteristics, and um, North Europeans have the best, the best genes. Um, but by the by the late 1850s, he stopped, and he began to talk about the uh, the fundamental equality of all people in regard to their cognitive abilities, imaginative abilities, um, everything. So he th there was. There, there was something about which, on which he evolved. For me, for me, a, a, a troubling question is: Okay, he he sharply distinguishes race from culture. He says all the races are equal, but to tell the truth, even though I appreciate other cultures, North European culture, Protestant culture, it's the best. And he continued to say that. But the problem with that is that he tried and he tried to deracialize that. He, he really tried. He said, I'm not talking about white culture. I'm talking about, I'm, I'm not talking about the white race. I'm talking about North European culture. So he tried to deracialize it. But the fact remained that most folk who participated in North European Protestant culture were white. So a, 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 I think a lingering question is, can, it re, can that kind of um, valorization of a particular culture, can it really be deracialized? So I don't know if it can be racialized, but it can be disguised. I can say that um, I am supporting other cultures and other races and other ethnicities, but in reality, I am not. So listening to your conversation and what I've heard of Mr. Shaw, the, um, it just seems that him being ambiguous and choosing to say that it's not the color of their skin, but the culture that matters to me. And I helped one slave um, get through their event, although I saw many others go to their demise. To me, doesn't he's not taking a stand. And I think I would respect it more if he took a stand one way or the other. Because I'm sitting here wondering, had the Civil War turned out a different way, which side of the street would he have been standing on? So I don't think he ever made a stand. And so his moral guide and his moral judgment to me is not speaking clearly. So I don't, I don't understand how we can continue to support someone who just seems to not be on one side or the other. Um, and yeah, he's, he's ambiguous about a lot of things. Um, about emancipation, uh, by 1861, as soon as the war started, he was clear that he was on the side of emancipation. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, so much so that he was on the hit list of the Confederate Army um, and served as a volunteer chaplain at, at the Battle of Antietam, for example, and encouraged uh, the students at, at Mercersburg Seminary to enlist in the Indian Army um, on the grounds that it was a war to end slavery. Um, so it would be as if like, the U U.S. went to war and I told all the students, you know, please don't come to class anymore. You know, join the Army and uh, fight for the cause. 
So he was clear about some things. And um, anti, anti, at least by 18, he was almost anti-slavery. It was just a movement from should it be gradual or should it be sudden uh, through, through a war. And by 1861, he was saying, yeah, it should, it should be through a war. When it wasn't clear that the Union would win. In fact, he was, in 1861, 62, it looked like the Union would lose. Uh, but he still said, we, we got to do it. We got to try. But yeah, he was um, ambiguous about a lot of things. And we probably would wish that he had been more forthright. Can I just add that to me, he's not that ambiguous because even though you separate race from culture, he never began to appreciate the black culture, yeah. Yeah. which is inseparable. Right. Um, the fact that he went to Hampton and saw, I mean, you know, black folks know how to put on a pageant, so I know that Hampton <laughs> back there in the 1800s put on a show yeah. for him, but he still yeah. wasn't impressed. He still didn't think that they, I mean, you know, I would have walked away thinking, wow, these people really got together, but still that was that lingering thought of like, well, are they You're really? Right. Yeah, because I think it's interesting, his rhetoric is sort of like after he uh, experienced, after the Civil War, uh, African-American education and saw it in practice, his response was, this is as good as white education. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, there's something you need here. It, it wasn't, there's something that we can learn from, from this experience. And uh, for, for me, the, my biggest disappointment is that he, never said anything particularly positive about the African-American church. He didn't treat that as another strand of Christianity that was offering something to the church universal. All he said was, they're sort of like Methodists. So adding to um, the thought about what were the instances where you could see that he was beginning to reform the, the activity with the slave um, who was his cook? Those are the sins of omission and commission, and we're seeing yeah. both both pieces in there. And I appreciate um, the comment that 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 is not the same as reconciliation. It doesn't really rise to the level of taking action and doing things that you might even feel a little at risk. You know, if you're a white person standing for black people and saying, it's part of my family, it's not okay for them. So it may feel like risk, you gotta take a risk at some time. The other thing is that his death was in 1893, which is when social Darwinism they got a hold in this country. So the, the continuation of abuse in the cycle of politics was, was enabled and set in motion too. Yeah. Of course, he was a big enemy of social Darwinism. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he thought that was just not only immoral, but also um, philosophically unjustifiable. So he thought it was wrong and stupid. Okay, right. so we are past our time. It's been a great discussion. Does, does anyone else have a question that you've been holding on to? I have one. I, what is the final decision-making process? Like, who's going to say, you know, yes, this is a decision, or no, this is not, given these lectures and, and surveys? Right. So, um, the community task force, uh, it's a task force that's appointed by the president. We were, um, Pointed for a year's worth of work, uh, which has involved uh, research and discussion, the planning of these events. And then uh, we're holding, uh, we have these feedback sessions, the feedback mechanisms. Uh, so after that, we will be making some recommendations to the president. We've already got in mind a few recommendations that we're gonna make, but we're really relying on the feedback that we get from all of our current students, um, as well as our alums. They will be receiving uh, the recordings of these events and uh, will also be invited to give some feedback. Um, 
so that will all inform these recommendations that we make to the president. And it is the president's decision what she chooses to do with that. So, um, if there are no other questions, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Do be sure to check in with Taman. He has uh, the clipboard uh, for you to um, sign in that you were here and to let us know uh, there's a yes or no if you would rather meet with a member of the community task force um, on a one-on-one -on -one feedback session. Um, Rich has um, our thank you flyers that have the link to the online feedback form. The online feedback form has the same questions that we're asking folks in our one-on-one -on -one sessions. So if you're not sure, you can check out the feedback form online. If you look at them and say, you know, I'd rather talk to somebody about this. Uh, John Paredes, who is a day uh, end of day student is uh, helping schedule, coordinate and schedule all of those uh, feedback sessions and his email is listed on this flyer. Uh, so you can be in touch with him if you change your mind and would like to uh, speak with one of us uh, and give your feedback to us uh, directly in a face-to-face in a -face session. And I like to um, have all of us on the task force to raise our hands so you kind of know who we are. And we're just missing one, which is John, right? And um, Sam Murphy. And Sam Yeah. Yeah. So good. So thank you all for coming. Really appreciate uh, the time that you've uh, spent with us this afternoon. And thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.